My name is Nina Murray, and today I am going to read to you an essay by Dr. Oksana Zabushka, a Ukrainian writer. I have translated Dr. Zabushka's novel, The Museum of Abandoned Secrets, as well as many pieces of her short prose. This essay is called We the Deported, a coda. This is no longer your home, the man with machine guns tell you. Pack up, the transport is ready. This message can come, has come, countless times, in different versions. For example, you have two hours to pack, or half an hour, or 24 hours, a difference in this case, nothing short of existential. Or, you are allowed two kilos of belongings per person or five, or as much as you can carry. And every clarifying detail here is worth its weight in living flesh, and each smells of breast milk, of freshly baked bread, of baby hair, and old photographs, of the conjugal bed, medicine, dried herbs in the sachet, the candle wax, plattered gods of the hearth, of that entire inalienable life of yours, fed into your blood by several generations and out of which you now must snatch with great precision a few essential elements so that it can stay intact and it's already fallen apart and you can throw together a new portable backpackable home for yourself a snail's shell that would keep you whole this is why it is in fact a very important question the question of all questions perhaps one, the answer to which will say much more about you than hundreds of questionnaires and quizzes of the five books you would take to a desert island variety. How much time would you need to pack if you found men with machine guns on your doorstep and they told you, get out, the transport is ready? This is not a journey. A journey is something from which you return. It's not immigration either. Immigration is something you choose. At least you retain agency in your actions. Here, the key word is transport, because you become cargo, a statistical unit of logistics on a mass scale, like a head of kettle or a cord of wood. Someone else's invisible will has determined that you are to be uprooted, like a tree, from your one and only home, from the landscape of your tribal genetic memory, as organic and tangible as a limb, to be transported across the map into oblivion, an abandoned and alien place. Now, they tell you, your home is here. Put down new roots. If you can't, if you wither, well, that's your own fault. Should the experiment be repeated on several generations, those subjected to it learn not to put down deep roots anywhere, ever. They learn to avoid becoming one with any place, like those unfortunate souls who had their first love brutally thwarted and spent their entire lives afraid of loving again. The instinctive bone marrow deep memory of the original trauma of being uprooted blocks every consequent attempt at rootedness, flashes a red alarm. A home of one's own, and by extension the protective concentric rings of one's village city and country around it is the thing that it hurts to lose so no please don't make me i'll have a light portable home instead this way should the doors fly open and the strangers with machine guns step inside you could pack grab the essentials your baby in the sling your laptop in your backpack your credit cards in your chest pocket you buy what you need wherever you are going hurry hurry the transport is ready and roll on with the wind through cold desolate space not rupturing anything no bleeding heart no slashed flesh having taught yourself to love not a point on the map but the distance between points not the stasis but the transition not a place, but the motion, the road, the railway station, the airport. You're up for it, this being a nomad, living out of a suitcase for years, decades if you have to, blind to your environment as a tourist is blind to the peeling, flea-stained wallpaper in hotel rooms. 
One learns to recognize them. Places that are unloved. Land that had been robbed of true owners. Villages littered with strangers' graves. Places under the pole of anemia as if someone had pumped all of their blood out and injected them instead with someone else's of incompatible type. The new rejected blood cells are people and they're loitering in these places among incomprehensible walls and neglected homesteads where other families' ghosts howl in the chimneys, leaves an outside observer with a disorienting impression that all these people are mentally not here, but elsewhere, some place where they secretly believe their real life, their own ancestral golden age is being kept with no expiration date or long-term penalties on ice awaiting defrosting. This faith of theirs stays with them as the smell, preserved somehow at the bottom of their own grandmother's hastily packed you have two hours suitcase. Even if nothing else could be preserved, taken along, this smell is forever. There is no home without it, not even a portable home. We catch whiffs of it in every corner of the world, at every latitude. Children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren of the deported, we have spread over the surface of the planet like a new ocean, carrying with us our virus of acquired home deficiency. We want to feel at home everywhere. And so we have homogenized, ironed out the universe into a few universally recognizable and therefore transportable elements, the highway, the gas station, the McDonald's, the airport. We rely on disposable cutlery and cycle through domiciles and localities as we do through laptops and mass produced winter coats. We have adapted quite well, when you think about it, nothing to complain about. The only thorn in our collective side is the smell. It can overcome you without warning. It ambushes you in a snippet of an old tune, an accidental combination of colors, the sound of a forgotten language. It's in the steam rising from a pot of food. Oh, yes, we are convinced this is exactly what it smelled like in the kitchen of our great, great grand home. Recipes are always replicated from memory, aren't they? So the same food tastes the same, no matter where it's cooked, doesn't it? The correct answer is no, it doesn't, but it's better not to know this. Movies, books, retro-styled cafes, historic reconstructions. We have spawned an entire industry of nostalgia, just so we wouldn't feel homeless. The smell still visits us in our dreams and can explode with sudden, awesome force reverberating through the entire length it, feel of that, it feels of that long, long ago unrooted trunk. And that's how you find a grown woman, a refugee from the occupied Donetsk, wailing and screaming at the stunned hospital personnel that they dare not, dare not designate her a migrant in their records because she is no migrant. Oh no, she had driven her own car here. And you cry with her. You wail right along, disapproving looks from the receptionists, be damned. Because you know this. Two or three generations ago, this woman's ancestors were brought to the Donbass to work the mines, like most of the locals to be, precisely as official Soviet migrants, in a kettle car, filled with other exiled kulaks. They were the lucky ones. My kin were taken out so, to so much, to much more distant lands, to Siberia and the Kazakh steppes, and the mines they dug there, and the cities that grew like polyps around those mines are now falling into ruin without any help from the Russian army by virtue of those lands restoring themselves to wilderness in the wake of the violence inflicted upon them by men, and there isn't anyone here who might look after the graves of those of my family's members who never came back. The woman in Kiev, the third generation deportee, had come back by herself. She drove her own car, 
And it does not matter that she was forced to do so, to pick up and go, albeit in the opposite direction this time, by men with machine guns, probably of the same brand then, all those years before. The, excuse me, probably of the same brand as all those years before. The important thing is that she is no longer a piece of cargo. She has her own car, a perfect snail shell, her portable home that she had managed to put together from the land that was never really domesticated and thus never loved, and thus the land so bitterly, hopelessly, and frighteningly left defenseless. I can picture her driving through the rolled-down window. She could smell the smoke of burnt-out fires, the steam of field canteens at checkpoints, exhaust and the breath of the spring step coming to life, the smell of home. <laughs>